So you've been out photographing landscapes or wildlife all day, and now it's time to take the raw files from your camera and turn them into photos that you can print or share on social media. This is a process that many photographers struggle with, especially if you're new to digital photography or if you're still developing a good repeatable workflow. In this video, I'll show you the workflow that I use along with a couple of examples. There are endless options for a post-processing workflow. When I first started editing photos, I was all over the place. Move a slider around here, then onto the next slider, move it around a bit, and this would just continue until I thought good enough or I just gave up. Results were rarely great, almost never repeatable, and usually frustrating. After learning more about the tools and editing digital images, I eventually got to the point of using a 10-step process for my workflow. In this video, I'll show you that workflow so that it can help you get started with your own workflow or help you improve the current workflow that you use. And this is not meant to be a detailed tutorial of any of the software tools that I use, but to provide an overview of my workflow along with a couple of editing examples. If you'd like to see more details on any of these steps, please comment below. For reference, I use Capture One for all of my file management, editing, and storage. Other software can use the same steps, but the naming will be slightly different. I also use Topaz Photo AI for any noise reduction or sharpening, uh, though that is really used mainly for my wildlife images. For hardware, I shoot with a Sony A1 in RAW. My computer is a 2014 iMac. Yeah, it may be old, but at least it's slow. I've got my eye on a Mac Mini M2 Pro that may help with that. So the workflow overview is first input from your SD card, coal, import, then format and shape that image. That's for lens correction, any initial cropping or keystoning. Third is the style, such as the ICC profile, any base characteristic curves, styles, and presets that you would apply. Then noise reduction if required. Then on to global adjustments such as white balance, exposure, contrast, shadows, and highlights. Six would be any local adjustments that you would make. Seven are the color adjustments. Eight is fine tuning of the image. Nine is out processing, output processing. That's the cloning, recrop for output uh, for different uh, uh, use cases. And the number 10 is to export for use. So let's go on to a landscape photo, for example. So moving over to Capture One, I would first, let's go to Library. Let's create a new catalog. I do all of my files in catalogs. So let's call this Workflow Demonstration. Let's create it. That's going to ask to back up my old system. We will then import images. And I've got a wildlife example, as I said, and a landscape example. So we'll import those two images. Okay, those are in. So let's select the landscape photo and move on to the next step, which is shape. So I'll do an initial crop of this one. We'll do a final crop at the end, but I want to get rid of some of the, uh, let's say the garbage in the photo that I knew was there when I was taking it. I just simply couldn't move to the right for a different composition. So again, we'll do that initial crop on the image. Let's just start with something like this. Okay, I'm not going to do any rotating or flipping, no keystone adjustments. Then you can go on to your lens correction, and it already selected uh, the correct lens based on the metadata. Probably very little pincushion distortion in this. We'll adjust 
just uh, slightly anyway. Sharpness mainly affects the corners. Light fall off, edges and corners won't correct for that. Then we move on to style. And this selects the ICC profile for the Sony A1 Pro Standard, which is uh, the profile I want to use. Curve, it's used auto. I'm going to go back to linear response, which is uh, a little bit flatter, contains all the data in there. Uh, I just prefer on some images starting with it, so that's what we'll do. I could apply any styles or presets, customer built in. I'm not going to do that here. All right, and then we'll move on to the adjustment tool, which will perform our global adjustments on first. In Capture One, I like to use layers for virtually all my edits. So what we'll do here is we'll go ahead and create a, uh, a field ad filled adjustment layer, and we'll rename that global adjustments. You don't have to add a layer here. I like having a layer so that it's easier to turn on and off later or I can do an opacity adjustment if I've overcooked some things just to uh, say tone it down a little bit so to speak. So you can tell on this image I underexposed it a bit looking at the, the histogram. So let's go ahead and first let's, let's up that exposure. Let's get about a half a stop up. And then I'd like to ch up the blacks point a little bit. Actually, probably quite a bit. Let's move that section of the histogram over the center, close to, not quite to the center, but let's get it over a little bit so I've got a little bit more contrast to work with later. So let's put that up to about 40 here, yeah, a little bit higher maybe. And then let's go to shadows and lift those as well. Okay, so I think I've got my exposure in pretty good shape there. Can also move on to um, levels and curves, and you could do everything from the sliders if you want. You can do everything from levels and curves if you want. I usually have something in between that I use, um, like to get my base exposure good, and then use levels and curves to help with the contrast. So let's go from there and. Let's change this a little bit and that'll move my blacks a little bit darker. I'm going to go too much. I said we've got more editing to do. Let's move, let's get recover a little bit of that. That's uh, 245, 240. And let's move my mid point gamma a little bit just get that so I want to recover as much as I can for a contrast so I think that's a, a decent starting point um, can always look at before and after on this as well with uh, uh, just a slider pane so that's after before so you can see we've Lifted everything, We've got uh, pretty good uh, exposure looking at the histogram. Let's move on to curves. And uh, I like to start out with a contrast RGB. And it auto inserts the points in there and you can continue to add points to manipulate the curve. <coughs> Excuse me. But as you can see that already gave me a pretty good lift in the uh, contrast and again I can go in and adjust each of these points if I want to bring down my blacks a little bit I'm going to go up too high with that 
Maybe actually pull that down a little bit too, get a little bit more contrast in the darker shades and the mid-tones. can pull those up a little bit. It's affecting my sky a little bit too much there, so I'm going to add another point. Oh yeah, there we go. Move that contrast up a little bit there. <clears throat> and then my sky. Let's keep that down here. Let's insert another point here. So getting kind of a shape of a classic S-curve in there. And that histogram looks pretty good there. There, There's really very little data here. So let's keep that there. So again, before, after. So I've recovered most of the information. I've got a decent looking um, histogram. Good exposure. Looks like I brought my contrast back as well. So let's leave that for the base adjustments. And again, I like to use layers for my local adjustments. I'm going to dial in the sky a little bit here. So let's call that sky. And um, let's fill, let's, let's actually try a, um, there's multiple ways to do this. Let's try a magic brush and see if it captures the sky. I could also do a linear gradient mask and pick that up. Um, maybe do some Luma curves to, to help block out anything that uh, I don't want to affect. But that actually picked it up pretty well. I can also go to this and I can feather the mask, the radius of it. And that will impact the edges of the mask, as you can see there. Probably don't want to leave a halo there, so let's let's fix that in there pretty well. Apply that. I can also refine the mask. And you see that starts pick it up a little bit more in the, the details here. Let's go ahead and apply it. I'm going to turn off the mask, which is M. M will toggle the mask in Capture One. Let's go to Exposure and let's bring this down just slightly. Let's get my histogram back up there. Just slightly though, probably don't even need to do that. Maybe just a little bit on there. Let's go to RGB on this one as well. As I said, let's get a little bit of contrast back in there. And... There we go. Let's raise that up a little bit. We can also, within that layer, now that we've got that selected, we can apply any adjustments we want just within the layer. So if I want to bring clarity up, I can do that. And again, it's just affecting the sky. If I want to saturate that, I can do that here as well. Maybe just a, just a little bit in there. And I'll come back later when I'm doing color adjustments and uh, uh, do some adjustments that will impact the sky at that time. So again, before, after. We'll leave it at that for demonstration purposes. Then looking around, the next thing um, I think I'll do is Get a little bit more detail back into the mountains here on the sides. It was a little hazy, a little misty on that day, and I couldn't quite cut through that. So let's uh, 
let's see if we can bring a little bit back on, on that. So Capture One has style brushes, the built-in style. Let's look at enhancement and add detail, which gives me a brush. Let's do a fairly large brush. Let's bring the hardness of that brush down really low. Whoops, I lost my brush. Let's bring the opacity down as well. And let's bring the flow down quite a bit. So these will be very slight impacts to it. And then I can just simply brush that in on this mountain. Turn mask back on so you can see that. Don't have to worry about painting outside the lines. I can do a luma curve on this and then restrict that to the darker portions and, and keep it out of the sky. So let's paint those in. I'll add a little bit over here as well. And again, this is very lightly being applied. So I've got the flow turned down so low and the opacity. So again, to show you, I can turn on a Luma mask on this as well. And let's eliminate the the highlights from it and you'll see the mass disappear from where I painted over the lines into the sky and let's apply that looks like I get a little bit in here as well okay let's turn the mask off and then I can look at this off and on so just a slight change to it, but I think that's all I needed for it. Uh, it's quite a distance away, but it's good to show a little bit of detail there since I've got the information in the file. Um, you can also dodge and burn directly from a style layer. So let's, uh, let's, let's do a little bit of dodging. Again, get the brush characteristics as you would like them. Again, this will be very light. So let's get a little bit, let's brighten this up a little bit. And I'm going to brighten everything, all of the uh, green patches as well, to help give the leading lines down to the center and help the viewer focus their attention down to the center. So let's paint those in a little bit. There wasn't a lot of sunlight on this day. But there were a little bit of uh, patches that were coming through the cloud cover. As we got further north it showed up a lot better. And I should have mentioned this this photo is taken at the Adigan Pass which runs through the mountain uh, the Brooks Mountain Range in Alaska up the Dalton Highway. So I'm going to actually dodge that a little bit all the way down again just to provide that direction for the eyes to travel towards the center since I've got a nice leading line there with the road and the stream. So again, I can turn that off, on, and the opacity slider will help you fine tune that. If you overcooked it, you can bring it down and so forth. Also got a little bit of haze back here. 
Let's get carried away and remove a, a little bit of the haze as well. And let's just do some real light brushing on it. Yeah, there we go. So that's the beauty of using layers. You can pull them in, you can come back, turn them off. I, as I said, I can come back and turn off my complete global adjustments if I wanted to back on or if I wanted to go there and uh, change the opacity a little bit if I think I overdid it now that I've done my local edits I think that's pretty good right there so next we would move on to any color adjustments and I like to use the color balance wheels for my color adjustments and that allows me to change the shadows, the midtones, and the highlights independently. And uh, I should have went ahead and added another layer for that. So let's go back up here. And let's just call this color balance. And let's do a fill mask on that before I forget. So let's, on the highlights, don't need to do a whole lot. It'd mainly be the sky. I can cool that off a little bit. Be a light cool. Yeah. I think we'll edge towards that. Just ever so slightly cool that. Can do the same with the shadows, which are, of course, going to get the the black points, so to be the, the rock sides of the mountain, will cool those a little bit. Not a whole lot, don't want to overdo it. <clears throat> then I can go to my mid-tones, which is mainly going to be the green, grassy places and the valley. I may warm that one up a little bit, just to make it a little bit more inviting. Whoops, wrong way, where am I at on this? It definitely doesn't need much. Let's just do that. Okay, so after you do the color adjustments, then you do any fine tuning, which on this uh, image I need to do a heel layer to heal out these uh, construction artifacts of when they were doing a little bit of uh, uh, drainage work, I believe, on the Dalton Highway. So let's add that layer in. And this will just be heal. So I'll select my... Oh, oh here it is. My healing mask. And that's a very small brush size. I'll use very hard we'll just turn all of that up and then all I have to do is paint over that I'm doing a real good job drawing that on there. But I think that'll take care of it and we'll let Capture One select the reference point. So I don't see, and I'm gonna crop this out, I believe, so I don't need to mess with that or, or this point as well. So yeah, let's, uh, let's go then now and do our final crop. So I think I want a crop that's going to be about, let's say, a 16 by 9 bore for if I decided to print the image or 
any posting, let's say, on uh, a Facebook photography group. And again, I want my... I'll get this out of here. I don't mind that rock being there. I want these leading lines to take the viewer in. So that's pretty close. I don't have any junk on the edges. So yeah, I think that'll work. And then if I wanted to do another clone, or if I wanted to do another adjustment for, let's say, an Instagram posting, I can clone this variant and do a crop for 4x5. Four so I don't think this is a great image for 4x5, but for demo purposes, let's see what we can do with it. It's, gonna, it's definitely going to have a different look to it. I don't want that garbage in there. And not an easy image to get. I want to cut the rock in half. See what that looks like. Yep, okay, so we'll go with that. Now I need to export it. And for Capture One, I select the Export tab. Oh, I want both images though. So we'll select both of these images. Then we'll go to Export. And Capture One uses export recipes. Just got selected a, a simple JPEG location. I'm going to start, sort off into a workflow demo location. You've got naming that you can do here, formatting and sizing, any adjustments, uh, watermarking, uh, metadata if you want it included or not into that export. So a very powerful tool for selecting just what you want to export with those files. Execute the export, and there we go. They are have the two files being exported out. So that's a complete flow using the landscape photo as an example. Let's go ahead and go on to the wildlife photo now, and uh, it'll be a little bit simpler edit on this, uh, just because they're isn't as much in the image other than a uh, bighorn sheep in early morning light being backlit by that light. And this was taken at Badlands National Park, probably about 7.30 in the morning. And uh, I love the colors in the background. And uh, I wanted to make sure I captured that so it was underexposed a little bit. But let's go ahead and walk through this shape. Again, this one was using the Sony 100-400, to which is an excellent lens. Probably very little pincushion distortion in that, but I can adjust for it. Sharpness on this lens is incredible. So I probably don't need to do anything with that. Maybe a little bit of light fall off on this. So I shoot, this was at 400 millimeter. But even that, there's not a lot of light fall off. Let's, let's go ahead and pull that up a little bit. Style. Again, it's using Sony A1 Pro Standard. And let's do a linear response on this one as well. It's a little flatter, a little darker, but just to be consistent. Then we can go on to the adjustment layer. I am going to do noise reduction on this one, which the way I do that will, I'll lose the adjustments I make here, but I can bring them back quite easily. So follow along with that. Um, and again, we'll just create a... Uh, global on this. Oh, let's not forget to fill that mask. And then we'll do a little bit on exposure. Maybe I'll come up again. About a, I could come up quite a bit, but what I don't want to do is blow it all out. I like that color tone that I had, so I'd prefer to leave that in there. And there's other ways I could do that and then just work on the shadows to bring a little bit back on this bighorn. 
But let's lift those up a little bit just as a starting point. This, this was shot at ISO 1000. There's not a lot of noise in the photo. There's a little bit. But so just to show you then the process I use when I'm going to do any noise reduction or sharpening, we'll take this image and we'll edit with process with Topaz Photo AI. And that creates a DNG file, which is what's recommended by Topaz um, to use to get the best results in noise reduction and sharpening. So I use it. It's quite a large file. Um, but I can delete it later after I complete my final edit because I can always recreate it if needed. So it's running through an autopilot and the interface between Capture One and Topaz is great. So it will automatically open the file up. Takes a little bit of time. As I mentioned, my computer is a little slow. So it opens it up. We'll begin running the, the autopilot settings on it, which will detect the subject, take a look at the noise to reduce it. Once it's detected the subject, it'll sharpen it up. So we see it did detect it. I'm going to use a standard V2 setting, which I like the best in their latest release. I know I want to pull that down a little bit. This does take a little bit of time. I don't do this to all images. I don't even do it to all my wildlife images. I will do it to some of them, especially if they really need the noise reduction. But for demonstration purposes, we'll go ahead and let it run and uh, wait for it to send the file, the complete file, back to Capture One so that I can finish the editing on it in there. Okay, so the preview's updated. That's what we have. Let's go ahead and send that back to Capture One. And it will uh, send that over to Capture One and uh, automatically reopen it there. So let's give that a few seconds. So okay, as you can see, we've now come back into Capture One where the DNG file from Photo AI was sent back. So I said I lost those initial global edits that I've done. But what I can simply do is go to Adjustments, Copy Adjustments, come back here, and Apply Adjustments. So now I've got those back. Now I can do any of the local adjustments that I will want to do. And there isn't a lot I want to do on this one. Um, I think what I will do, though, is do a little bit of... Uh, detail adjustment on this one. So I'll go back to my style brush. Let's add some detail around the eye. Let's bring the size, hardness, opacity down a little bit here, low flow again. So the standard thing that I do when I brush in these, it's a little bit of detail in his eye. So other ways I could have done this as well. I could have done a radial mask. I've gotten used to using the style brushes, so I use those quite a bit. Let's get a little bit of, let's get this a little bit larger. Let's brush in a little bit of detail on these horns as well. So I really had beautiful light on this guy. Let's add a little bit in through neck as well, just to get a little bit of that detail out. Had such nice backlighting there, kind of show it off a little bit. Let's go ahead and do a little bit of... Uh, um, dodging as well while we're here just to demonstrate you can do all of the same things again that we did on the landscape photo 
And here, let's, let's get a little bit more attention to his eye. Maybe a little bit brushed in here. Just again to show that off a little bit more. Alright, I think that's pretty good. So then let's do a crop. If I look around at this, I'm going to focus in on the head area. This is a little distracting, so let's move that over. Let's keep that last one in. I like the, the look of the plants with those uh, highlights hitting it since we had that beautiful early morning light. Possibly go back and add a little bit of detail here as well if we wanted to. Really lead you in and you can see in the whiskers like that. So, I think that's it. That's a good example. Shows how to apply the workflow to a landscape photo as well. Or, I'm sorry, to a wildlife photo as well. So, I think I'll wrap it up there. That's the overview of my 10-step process workflow and an example of a landscape photo as well as a wildlife photo taken through that process. If you have any questions or would like to see any more detailed information of any of those process steps or editing techniques, since I didn't really cover that in a lot of detail, leave it in a comment below and I'll get to it. And thanks for joining today.